Hello, and welcome to today's Summer with the Library program. My name is Jennifer Duarte, Children's Librarian from the Benjamin Franklin Branch Library, and I'm here with my colleague, Gladys Martinez, Children's Librarian at the R.L. Stevenson Branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. It's not required to enjoy today's program, but you can use any type of yarn to create today's pom-pom art project. Yes. yes. We're so happy to host this wonderful performance today. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate with the performer and to let us know of any questions or thoughts that you have come up during the performance. We would like to thank our generous donors at the Library Foundation for giving us the opportunity to feature these awesome performers. We are switching from our regular story time to bring you a special creative program for the entire family. This program very much supports early learning, new words, and curiosity. So today we are so happy to host author and crafter Danielle Davis. Danielle Davis is the author of Zinnia and the Bees. She also facilitates creative writing workshops for young writers. And so today Danielle is here to talk to us about the art of yarn bombing, bees, and the creative writing process. Take it away, Danielle. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Den and Gladys. I'm such a fan of the library. I was telling the librarians earlier that I just put a book on hold this morning as I'm always doing at the library. And I see a few of you in the chat and I hear that some of you are regular. So welcome and thank you so much for coming this morning. I see Gian is here. I see Nina is here and Hugh and Otis. And I see, is it Nyla potentially? Nyla and Michaela, forgive me if I'm not getting your names right, uh, but I'm so glad that you're here. And so um, let's see, I have so much love for the library, but I am here to talk to you about a bunch of things. And so I think I will get started doing that. And we're gonna have some slides that will be on the screen. And I think you'll see me and the slide, and I won't be able to see your comments, but the librarians you just met, the wonderful librarians you just met, will be able to see your comments. And so I hope that you'll continue to leave them. I'll even be asking questions. And then the librarians will be jumping in to hear or read what your answers are. And so it'll still be interactive this way. So thank you so much. And we'll, we'll start. So I'm going to start this presentation and you will see it. So can I just get confirmation from our librarians that we're seeing the, the slide? Yes, we can definitely see it. Thank okay. you, Danielle. Super. Um, so I'm going to move right along. So my first book is a novel that is called Zinnia and the Bees. And so you might have heard of it and these librarians just lifted it up. And the reason there is a doodle of me with um, those two items is because that's what the book is about, bees and yarn and knitting and crocheting. And so those are two things that I will talk with you about. And essentially, the book, the story is about Zinnia, who is 12 years old. And it's also about a colony of honeybees. And it's here in Los Angeles. And there's a colony of honeybees that is searching for a home and they see Zinnia's curly, wild, beautiful hair and they decide we're gonna try and make our home there. And so they land on her head, mistaking it for maybe what will be a proper hive, but it's not a proper hive and it's a big burden to Zinnia. So that's the crux of the story. And so it's really a story about searching for home because the bees are looking for a proper, real hive home, and Zinnia is looking for a home within herself and in the world, as we all are. And so the theme, um, which I'm hoping you're seeing me moving these slides, the theme is to be yourself, to be creative, and to connect. And I think that writing and reading and making things like yarn bombing can all be ways to do those things. So I'm going to show you the trailer of the book and it's short, it's just a minute and it's made with stop motion and it'll give you a sense of the book and it's kind of all about being creative, being yourself and connecting. 
So here we go. I'll push play now and you will get to see it. trailer of Sinia and the Bees and now we're going to transition and talk about bees of course. Maybe some of you like bees, maybe some of you don't like bees. I wonder if any of you have been stung by a bee but I bet there is a bunch of stuff you already know about bees before I tell you anything and if you want you can put in the comments something, some fact that you know about bees. What do you know about bees insects? It could be really really simple um, like what color or colors they are. Uh, it could be anything you've heard about bees that you think is true from science or anything else. Uh, it could be an experience that you've had with a bee before. And I also wonder if you know and could put in the comments how many legs bees have, because they're an insect. And that picture on the screen doesn't actually demonstrate how many legs they actually have. So I wonder if you know how many legs they have and if you might write that in the comments. How many legs do bees have? Does anyone know? Anyone put it in the comments? Well, so we have um, Blue Chocolate Love mentioned that they make honey. Oh, yes. And Bubble Sake says that they are black and yellow. Yes. And and Mina says they go <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wonderful, true facts about bees. Yes, yes, and then we have a couple of comments about the legs. So we have six, two, six seems to be the general consensus. And William says, if a bee has a stinger, it's a female. Ooh, yes, these are all wonderful. And those of you who are saying six, that's right. Bees have six legs dangling below them. And I wonder if you know how many wings they have. How many wings does a bee have? And again, it's kind of a trick question because even the image that you'll see on the screen is not totally reflective of how many wings a bee really has. So I wonder if you want to put in the comments, how many wings does a bee have? I see two wings coming in. So two seems to be um, what people are saying. Otis says two wings. Well, it was a trick question and it's four. They have kind of two sets of wings. And so you're kind of right anyway, but they have technically four wings. And I wonder, final question, this is also a trick. It's a big trick. Um, how many eyes, how many eyes do you think bees have? How many eyes do bees have? I wonder if you'll put it in the comments. Or you'll just think about it. There's no right answer really, because it's a trick, but maybe one of you is a bee expert, and so you know this. So we have Sungjin saying two and four. So there's uh, at least two. <laughs> that is correct, there are at least two. So these are all wonderful. Um, ideas and we have two, right? And four makes a lot of sense. It's actually five. Bees have five eyes, which is why it's a trick question and why they are in part so unusual and amazing. We'll talk about their eyesight in a second. And I'll tell you a couple other neat things about bees. Bees bake. So what do I mean by that? 
They don't bake like us where they put something in the oven, but kind of because they take nectar and honey that they have collected and then made and they put it in a part of their honeycomb hive. And then just like we would put, say, bread or something else in the oven, they wait. They put it together, they wait, and then they take it out of their, their oven, right? Uh, their honeycomb hive. And then they have something that scientists call bee bread. And it's not like our bread, but it is what scientists call bee bread. So bees bake, which is pretty amazing. They're pretty amazing creatures. They also dance. I wonder if anyone know or knew already that they dance. And I wonder if anyone knows the name of the dance that bees do. It's a really special dance. And you might put in the comments if you know what the name is. I'll wait to tell you what the name is. But basically, a bee will show another bee or the whole colony where the food is, right? We know the food is in the flowers for them, the pollen and the nectar. And so they'll do this elaborate dance where they wiggle around in certain motions that tells the other bees what direction to go to get to the flowers and the food source. Danielle, so we have um, William saying uh, they think it's the wiggle dance. <gasps> So close. I really like the wiggle dance. It's technically called the waggle dance, but they do wiggle as they're doing the waggle right dance. So that was very close. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, and then let's see what else. Oh, bees are essential for human food. So we eat because bees exist, which is a reason we need to really protect bees and make sure that they're safe and healthy and provide environments and flowers and trees where places they can live. That's one of the reasons that the bees in the story had to go on Zinnia's head because they couldn't find a proper hive because there wasn't a natural place for them. So they pollinate, right? They pollinate food for us on the flowers that grow on the food and they pollinate one third of the food that we eat. So out of every three fruits or vegetables, bees are responsible for pollinating one of those. So cabbages and almonds and blueberries and all kinds of fruits and veggies that we love to eat, we wouldn't have them if not for bees. And uh, another thing is that bees have really super eyesight. Remember they have those five eyes? So they can say, see UV light, which we can't. So I'll show you what that looks like. Here's a flower that you and I see if we have sight, right? We're able to see this and we see the yellow. Here's what bees see. It looks more purple, right? Because they're seeing a different kind of UV light. And notice how there's that rim, that darker purple around the center of the flower. And that's because then it kind of goes and it shows them exactly where to go to get to the food that they're looking for that's in the very center. Here's another one that kind of looks UV, but it is not because look, this is how they see it. So we see it this purple and white, and then they see it in this technicolor. So bees have amazing eyesight and can see stuff that we don't see. Here's another example. We see this yellow flower. Maybe it's a kind of dandelion, I'm not sure. And then this is what they see. And that red that they see, is kind of like a landing pad. So you can think about a helicopter landing on a circular pad, right? So they know where to go. That's what it's like for bees. And one more thing about bees, they make great accessories. Did you know that? That's a little bit different. It's not so scientific, but have you ever heard of a bee beard? So we know what a beard is, right? It's a bunch of hair on our face like this. And sometimes, they are made of bees. And so I'll show you some pictures while I tell you about bee beards. This is an example of one. And you can see why it's called a bee beard because it's a bunch of bees and they're in the shape of a beard. And so this is something that people choose to do and it doesn't hurt the bees and it doesn't hurt the people either. Usually, you know, bees will only sting you if they're kind of agitated or something happens unusual. And so these bees aren't stinging this person either. So basically, you could go to a beekeeper, and a beekeeper will take the queen. These are some more people who are wearing bee beards, even bigger ones. So the beekeeper will take the queen, which is the biggest, right, the biggest one, and the heart of it, uh, the leader of the, the bee colony. And they'll put that bee around someone's neck, 
And so then the other bees, because their job is to protect the queen, she is so important, they will then kind of flock all around and um, become this kind of entity all around the queen making a bee beer. So this is kind of a fun thing that people do to learn about bees. And these are even more intense bee beards. And these people look like they're a little bit more scared because there are so many bees, um, but they are okay. And I hope no one is scared by this. Um, and I also wonder if someone wants to put in the comments if they would ever get a bee beard. I have to say, I love bees, but I would not want to get a bee beard. Um, and then I have another question for you in the comments. And it's a guessing question. How many bees? This was a record holder in China for how many bees this person could have on their body. They won, a, a, they won some kind of record for this because it was the most ever recorded. And so I wonder if you want to guess how many bees this person is wearing, or you could guess how many pounds of bees they have on them. It's almost like armor. So would you get a bee beard? How many bees do you think are covering this person in terms of number or pounds? So as we wait for those comments to come in, I think I'm I'm in the same camp, Danielle. I don't I love bees, but I don't think I would get a bee beard. But that's amazing. I've never seen these kind of pictures. So so we're we're still waiting for comments. So if you want to continue, and then as soon as we get those comments, I will chime in. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, the problem is the next slide is going to tell you the answer. Um, so you could still, I'll tell you the answer, but you can still chime in. Oh, we have, we have, uh, William says 1 million. Ooh. And Sung Jin says 100. Ooh, so we have a huge difference. Um, and Blue Chocolate Love says 5 million bees. Whoa, well now you're gonna be underwhelmed by the answer, <laughs> which is 220,000 bees. And this might be easier to picture or understand, 50 pounds. So if you know how much you weigh or something else weighs, you can imagine wearing 50 pounds on top of that, of like an armor of bees. That is what that very brave person who probably practiced a lot for that is wearing in terms of bees. And at any moment, you can tell us if you would get a bee beard or not. You can also tell us if you have been stung by a bee before. Um, and I hope that you haven't, but I also hope that you're okay now and maybe not afraid of bees anymore. So there's another thing. We've talked about bees, right? Because bees actually, in Zinnia and the bees, there are chapters that are told from the perspective of Zinnia, the 12-year-old who's on the cover. And there are also chapters that are told by the bees themselves as a collective voice. So the bees tell their own story. But of course, Zinnia has her story because she's experiencing this in a different way. And one thing about Zinnia is that she is a yarn bomber. And so I wonder if any of you know what knitting or crocheting is um, with yarn and needles. If you maybe know someone who knits or crochets, or maybe you know how to knit or crochet yourself or you want to learn. So Zinnia does that. And not only that, she's a yarn bomber, which is basically, it's not violent, even though it has this word bomber in it. It's really cool. It's a form of street art for knitters and crocheters, and they basically adorn and decorate the world with yarn, sometimes really simply and sometimes more elaborately. And I wonder if you have ever seen, I'm gonna show you pictures, don't worry, but I wonder if you have ever seen, for example, a parking meter that has yarn on it. It's almost like these items are wearing a sweater. Um, or a, uh, maybe you've seen a tree, that's a really common one, that's kind of wearing a sweater. So these can be uh, things that artists make because they wanna make a statement about something, or maybe they just wanna bring joy and color to the world and make people kind of stop and notice. So this is some yarn bombing. This is really elaborate, amazing yarn bombing on trees. I don't know where these are or who did them, but they're super amazing. So this is yarn bombing. And see, it's so colorful and it makes you kind of experience the world differently and be surprised with imagination. Remember, be yourself, be creative, connect. Yarn bombing is all about that. 
Here's one that is, it looks like it's a squid or octopus tree that is a yarn bomb. And I wonder if now that you've seen some yarn bombs, oh, I never noticed there's that little fish in the tree. Uh, on, I see it on the far right. There's that goldfish kite, maybe. I've never seen that before. And I wonder if now that you're hearing about it and seeing some yarn bombs, if potentially you will now notice them if you're out in the world, if you will now notice them and see, oh, that's a yarn bomb. And you'll see that one of them, those are like all hugging, right? I love that one with all the hands hugging. And then you'll notice that there are some pom poms hanging from the other one on the top of that tree. And you can keep that in mind because you're gonna be invited to potentially make a pom-pom like that for your own yarn bomb if you want to. And remember, oh. Danielle, I just wanted to also mention that Mateo, he's two years old and he's fearless. He once poked a bee. <gasps> ah! <laughs> that is fearless. Yes, and Jess, talking about knitting, she says, or they say that they love to knit. Oh, neat. So with bees, I always, if I ever go swimming and see a bee in the pool who's kind of like this, you know, um, wobbling around, wiggling around, as one of you said, I always try and scoop it out safely to save the bee because then what happens is it dries up and it gets to fly away. Uh, and in terms of knitting, that's so cool that you're a knitter. I have to confess I am not myself a knitter or crocheter, but of course I took a knitting class. Or was it crocheting? It's been so long now. Um, I think it was crocheting. I took a crocheting class so that I could learn so that I'd be able to write and know what it's like to knit. And then I also asked a friend of mine who's a knitter to go through the book and make sure that everything I had said about knitting and crocheting felt real to them. And they corrected a couple of things because they were like, wait, 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 that's a little bit different. Or that wasn't described quite right because you know the experience of what it's really like to knit. And I am not an expert in it. And so parking meters are another really common kind of yarn bomb. So you might see the more simple ones like on the bottom right, or you might see these elaborate cool creature ones. And these are really elaborate. So the bike, notice the pom-poms again. And then a telephone booth, I think that's in England and the UK. And then the Craft and Folk Art Museum is right here in Los Angeles uh, in Wilshire district across from the LA County Museum of Art. It's a wonderful museum. And a few years ago, they did a whole exhibit on yarn bombing. And so to celebrate it, they yarn bombed, or whoever it was, the artist yarn bombed the building, which is so amazing. And there are people who are yarn bomb artists. This is what they do for their work and their art. And so they'll do really creative things like this splat all kinds of things that are just mind-boggling. Here's one that's a lion. It looks like it's in a school, very elaborate. And that has to do a little bit with um, Zinnia and the bees as well, which I'll tell you about. And you can notice the tail of the lion looks a little bit like a pom-pom, pom-pom-ish. And this one, I would invite you to put in the comments if you know what children's picture book this is a recreation of the cover of. This is by someone I know named Jenny Brown, and she did this for a school. And it represents a very famous picture book. It's really wonderful and beloved from a long time ago. I wonder if anybody has seen that before, or if they even know the name of it. I bet the librarians know this one for sure. Yes, for sure. And we have Blue Chocolate Love saying, and Jess saying, The Snowy Day. Yes, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. Um, so that is a really beautiful one. And that's such a, a, an authentic recreation, right? It really looks like the cover. And so I asked Jenny Brown, who made this one, to I commissioned her to make a yarn bomb of the cover of my book, Zinnia. So I'll hold up the cover, and then I'll show you a picture of what she created as a yarn bomb. So she made this and it's very um, uh, 3D. That hair is like whole skeins of yarn, whole bundles of yarn, right? And then all of those bees that she made that are so intricate. And then I hosted uh, maybe a year or two ago, a giveaway. So this is now in a classroom somewhere. So a classroom teacher has this hanging in their room, which is really special. 
So that is yarn bombing. And the beauty of it is you don't have to be an amazing knitter uh, or even know how to knit to do something that is yarn bomb-ish, right? So we have an idea for you. And of course, we're not gonna do it here in case you don't have the materials, but we're gonna give you instructions in the chat, in the comments, so that you can um, print or download or even copy down, if that's the best thing, how to make pom-poms. And these are examples of the pom-poms that I've made with kids all over the place um, for the books, and yeah, and the bees. And it's super fun, and it doesn't take a super long time. And this is one that right here in Los Angeles um, at a maker space, some kids and I got, well, the teacher got permission from a park. So it is nice to get permission if you're going to do a yarn bomb. So that way, you know, it won't be taken down. But all we did is we made pom-poms, which you're about to hear about. And then we wrapped together, we wrapped this tree in string, and then everyone contributed their pom-pom. So that's another thing about yarn bobbing is that often it's something you can do with other people, but of course it's something you can do in secret, clandestine, uh, by yourself if you want to also. So these are those instructions, and they're written so that a grown-up can help you make them. Uh, and they're also drawn by my friend and illustrator Kate Walsh so that you can see how to make them also. So you'll need a little bit of cardboard, so you might need some help cutting the cardboard out of, say, a box that arrives in the mail, maybe, or a box that you can find somewhere at the grocery store. Um, and then you'll need to cut it into that shape that you see for step one. And then you'll need some yarn. So one skein or bundle of yarn is enough. You could also do a few different kinds of yarn, different colors, and mix them up. That's something else you can do that's fun. And you'll see in these photos, some of them are multicolored. And that just means you're wrapping that cardboard with a bunch of different kinds of yarn or colors of yarn. Um, and then you'll need some pretty good scissors. And again, somebody else might want to help you with that part. And it says you need very little time because this won't take you long. And you'll see down below, it's like you can string them together. You can wear them like an accessory. You could put them on a keychain. You could make a little creature. I really like to have people name their pom-poms. So each pom-pom gets its own name. Um, you can also make a bunch of pom-poms and then like yarn bomb something in your home or on say your backpack or something like that. You can make a bracelet or anything, the sky's the limit. So those will be in the comments, those instructions, so that you can do that. And then as we're, uh, we're in this creative mode thinking about pom-poms, but if you don't immediately have yarn right now to make a pom-pom, and that's something you need to kind of get, there is something you can always do, and that's writing. You don't need anything really but your mind, and you also might need you know, a pencil and a piece of paper. But a lot of writing is done in the mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you the first line of my book. I'll talk a little bit about first lines. And then I would invite you to write or even just think up a first line for a story that you might write. Because I want you to be yourself to be creative and to connect because writing and reading and all of these things help us connect to other people through our creativity and being who we truly are. And each of you has a unique voice and a unique point of view and a unique imagination that I think is really special and just is calling to be shared. So for the first line of Zinnia, it's pretty short. You'll see it right here. And the first chapter is called Operation Yarn Bomb. So that gives you a clue. And the first line is, Ronnie the Rattlesnake is naked. So what first lines do is they invite the reader into the story. They make the reader want to read more and experience more. They give some clues about what the story is going to be about and also what it's going to be like. What kind of tone is it going to be? And it also, the first line might ask questions. So for this one, Ronnie the Rattlesnake is naked. I noticed that it's kind of funny and weird and quirky. And I think that the book is a little bit like that because Zinni is a little bit like that. I also noticed that it kind of asks questions. Why does it matter that a rattlesnake is naked? Aren't, aren't rattlesnakes always naked? So it might make you want to keep reading. 
why does it matter that it's naked? And if you know about the, ti the title of the chapter, Operation Yarn Bomb, you might connect that, hmm, maybe that rattlesnake was supposed to be yarn bombed. And in fact, that's right. It was a statue at Zinnia's school that she had yarn bombed in secret because she thought Ronnie deserved a yarn bomb. She'd even named Ronnie. It's their school mascot. And then she arrived the next morning and Ronnie was naked. So this is already like, what is happening? So that's the first line of my story. But I wonder if you might think of brainstorm today or tomorrow or jot down or just in your imagination be kind of kicking this around, a first line for a story that you might write. And then maybe you will write that first line. And then maybe you will keep writing and you'll keep thinking about that story, what that story could be, who's in that story, how do you want to tell that story, who are the characters in that story that only you could write as you be yourself and you're being creative. Um, and then if you want, I have a YouTube channel called This Writer's Life. And it is creative writing videos. And I talk about creative writing and give you writing prompts and encouragement and inspiration. And then each time I also have someone I know and admire come on and give creative advice from their creative process to inspire you and not just hear from me. And we have an episode, episode two, there are 30 some episodes now, but the second one was about first lines. And my, my friend Bonnie Eng comes on and she gives inspiration about her creative process as a food stylist. Um, and so you might want to watch that video and we'll put the link to that in the comments as well as you write your own first line. So that is all I have to share with you. I wonder if there's anything from the comments um, that I have missed during this. Ooh, we have a first line in the comments. You want to read it, Jen? Yes. So Blue Chocolate Love says, quote, seriously, I say. And that is the start of a very fascinating story, I would say. What do you think, Danielle? Oh, I agree. Um, <laughs> It asks me questions, right? It tells me a lot about my character, too. Like something has just happened, and they're like, seriously? Or maybe they say it in a different tone. I want to know what are they responding to. So right. I'm reading that story. I hope you'll write it. If I anyone, love it. I love it for our budding writers and authors. This is just some great advice and tips. And Miss Al says, this is great. Ah, oh, I concur. Thank you so much, Danielle. This and is so so awesome. Are there any questions for Danielle? Hi. I would like to invite you. Any questions about bees or anything at all? Um, I think this was just so wonderful, Danielle. And you brought us your expertise on yarn bombing and writing, right? And definitely all about bees as well, right? I learned a lot about bees. And I want to remind all of our audience and our families that we have all kinds of bee books in the library, nonfiction. So you'll find books about uh, bees and what they eat, how they live, so on. And you'll also find fiction books about bees uh, in the case of Zunia and the bees. So we have a question now. Ms. L asks, are there any other books coming out? Oh, thank you for that question. And if anyone wants to write their first line in there, we're here to cheer you on. Um, <laughs> Um, I do have a book coming out in about a year, so we'll be waiting another year for it, but it's a picture book, which I was telling the librarians earlier, really a first love of mine. I love picture books, and I think they're for every age, and it's called mm -hmm. To Make. So it's actually about the creative process, and it's illustrated by Mags DeRoma. And so it's a book about creativity for everybody, and it relates to pom poms, right? And writing and making of any kind, and it's an encouragement and manual. Yes, and so also another question: Would you like bees to live in your hair? <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> I would not. Um, and in fact, the idea came from the idea of. Um, the way anxiety can feel when you're worried about something. Mm -hmm. And Zinnia is worried about a lot of things. And at the time I was writing, so I was worried about a lot of things. So many of us are worried about things. 
and it can kind of feel like every worry is one of those bees kind of crawling around. So I definitely don't want too many worries and I don't want bees. Any other questions? And I have one question for you, Danielle. Um, Zinnia, where'd you get the name? Is that a name that you made up or how did you come across the name? Well, I wonder if anyone in the comments knows why I might have chosen Zinnia. And I also love that Blue Chocolate Love would like bees in their hair. I'm so <laughs> impressed, that's wonderful. Um, yes. And I know some people will get bees in their hair from time to time. Not this many, not a whole colony, but once in a while, right? Um, well, now I forgot the other question. Oh, Zinnia. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Zinnia is a kind of flower. Oh, oh Miss Al. Yes. Yay, Miss Al. Exactly. So Miss L is correct. Um, Zinnia is a kind of flower, and so I thought, hmm, would these exactly blue chocolate love because she has bees in her hair and so what kind of person would these be attracted to a flower i thought that was something neat to me zinnia yes definitely beautiful all right so thank you so much danielle for this wonderful presentation and thank you all to our families and for all of you for joining us today uh, we hope you join us next week uh, same place, Facebook and YouTube, live from the Los Angeles Public Library's channel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. I love the Los Angeles Public Library. Hooray for all of our librarians doing wonderful work. Let's all go get books on hold and visit them. And books are, books are life, right? And reading is life. And the library facilitates that. Uh, they do wonderful programs. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And don't forget, um, if you haven't already, to join our summer reading challenge. You can sign up online at lapl.org forward slash summer, or you can come into any branch and pick up a game board. You'll also receive a bookmark that you can color, and it comes with this nice little sun that comes off, which is actually a seed packet, so you can grow some herbs at home. Um, also, when you complete the challenge, you'll get a cool bandana in either blue or yellow. And uh, you'll also be in a drawing to win other prizes, like a cool bag or maybe a water bottle. So, um, so just don't forget to turn in your game board by August 7th. Um, thank you all for attending today, and I hope to see you again. Bye.